storms end. The seat of the Storm Kings going back thousands of years from the Baratheons to the Durandans. A wall 100 feet high and more than 40 feet thick, built by Bran the Builder and Durin God's Grief, the very first Storm King, to withstand the wrath of the gods themselves for Durin's daring to marry their daughter, Elena. His previous six castles and his family were destroyed by the wrath of the sea and wind gods. Durin's seventh castle stood against the divine might and against all attackers for generations. It held against the First Men, the Andal invasions, the Ironborn and Harren Hor, and even Aegon the Dragon. No enemy has ever breached the supposedly magical walls by force or siege. That is, until now. In the Winds of Winter, young Griff, who claims to be another Aegon, the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, and his Golden Company have somehow done what none could do before. The fortress of Durin God's Grief has fallen, and how this happened is a puzzle many readers have been trying to solve. Today, with the help of a curious encounter from Fire and Blood, I propose how Griff and his Hand of the King, John Connington, will take the nigh-invincible Storm's End without a battle or a drop of blood. In A Dance with Dragons and Into the Winds of Winter, the Golden Company have been landing all over the Stormlands, their ships blown off course by, unbelievably, storms. Storms in the Stormlands. Who'd have thunk it? Despite the stormy setback, the castles of House Rain, Estremont, Morgan, and Griffin's Roost all fell to the Golden Company pretty quickly. Those were easy pickings for the 10,000 strong Golden Company led by homeless Harry Strickland, John Connington, and young Griff. A large percentage of the military-aged Stormlanders died in the wars of Renly and Stannis Baratheon, particularly at the Battle of Blackwater, leaving the region weakened. More were taken north with Stannis to aid the Night's Watch and have not returned as they face the Winds of Winter. A fresh Golden Company with the element of surprise knocked down smaller castles with ease. Storm's End, though, presents a very different challenge. As Stannis himself has proved against Mace Tyrell, the impressive defenses have made it possible for a small garrison to hold the walls against besieging armies numbering in the tens of thousands for years at a time. With that in mind, this venture seems insane. How could you hope to assault Storm's End and win with so few troops and such little time? John Connington cryptically answers. If Storm's End is so impregnable, how do you mean to take it? Ask Malo. By Guile. By Guile, I don't think he means the flat top street fighter famous for his sonic booms. At least I hope not. That would certainly be a twist if Guile is serving in the Golden Company. Old Jaycon may have some tricks up his sleeve. When army after army for thousands of years failed to siege or scale the walls, it's unlikely that Connington's clever plan involves joining the long list of distinguished lords who failed to assault Storm's End. In the introduction, what I said was correct, that no army has ever breached the walls. The same cannot be said for individuals. Our most famous example is when Davos Seaworth uses his smuggling skills to evade the naval siege lines in Shipbreaker Bay to deliver his boat full of onions and a red priestess. Davos did not try to climb the walls or go through them. Instead, he went under them. Davos threaded their way deftly between the jagged rocks until the mouth cave loomed up before them. He let the waves carry them inside. They crashed around him, slamming the boat this way and that and soaking them to the skin. A half-seen finger of rock came rushing up out of the gloom, snarling foam, and Davos barely kept them off it with an oar. Then they were passed, engulfed in darkness, and the water smoothed. The little boat slowed and swirled. The sound of their breathing echoed until it seemed to surround them. Davos had not expected the blackness. The last time, torches had burned all along the tunnel, and the eyes of starving men had peered down through the murder holes in the ceiling. The portcullis was somewhere ahead, he knew. Davos used the oars to slow them, and they drifted against it, almost gently. This is as far as we go, unless you have a man inside to lift the gate for us. His whispers scurried across the lapping water like a line of mice on soft pink feet. Using a secret passage only available at high tide, Davos reached the secret entrance to Storm's End and gained entry because the defenders saw the food and let the smuggler inside the walls. Melisandre managed to breach the walls in her own way with her shadow babies, 
Although Jaycon also has that fabulous red hair, I don't think he's up to squeezing out a shadow baby. So the best way for Connington to get into Storm's End would be the Davos way. Get the garrison to open the doors for you. This presents a bit of a problem though, as the Storm's End garrison was left under the command of Stannis' men. And that garrison is commanded by Sir Gilbert Faring, a knight loyal to Stannis and not one of those post Renly's murder converts. A few good men remain, it's true. Sir Gilbert Faring holds Storm's End for me still, with 200 loyal men. Lord Morgan, the bastard of Nightsong, young Chittering, my cousin Andrew. But I trust none of them as I trust you, my lord of Rainwood. You will be my hand. It is you I want beside me for the battle. Perhaps the Golden Company could pose as members of Stannis' host, pretend to be the soldiers and knights he sent back to Storm's End for some reason, and demand entry. There's even some members of Stannis' army supposedly on their way across the Narrow Sea in the Winds of Winter. Justin Massey was commanded by Stannis to journey with the Bravosi banker Tycho Nestoris back to Bravos. Stannis recently secured an enormous loan from Tycho and wants Justin to spend the Iron Bank's money on 20,000 sellswords. Depending on the timeline, there could be some spare flaming stag tunics floating around the Narrow Sea that the Golden Company could make use of to disguise themselves as Stannis loyalists. Dragonstone also has a garrison of Stannis' men, but unfortunately by the time the Golden Company has landed, they are under siege by the forces of Kingsguard Loris Tyrell. That seems like a massive long shot to me. Massey is going from the north to Bravos and should never even come close to the Stormlands. Besides which, Connington has really no idea that's happening, and they'd have no one that could even pretend to be a commander or knight of Stannis who would have the authority to be sent back and demand entry. The idea has been proposed that the Golden Company may not pretend to be Stannis' soldiers, but instead pretend they were hired by him. Use their reputation as a premier sellsword company to gain access to the castle. While I have my doubts on the method, I think this is the right idea. Coerce the garrison into opening the gates for someone they are loyal to, the castle is yours. Completely bypass the defenses and unseigeable walls, then stroll in without a drop of blood spilled. That pesky Sir Gilbert stands in the way, but John Connington doesn't need to trick Sir Gilbert. He only needs to convince the rest of the garrison that they should ignore their castellan. And while Stannis calls the garrison loyal because they swore fealty to him, there's good reason to think otherwise. That garrison is still largely made up of Renly's men who know Stannis killed their former commander, Sir Courtney Penrose, and their king. During the War of the Five Kings, Renly left Storm's End in order to secure his allegiance to the Tyrells and marry Queen Marjorie. Sir Courtney Penrose was left in charge with Lord Elwood Meadows' second in command to not only guard the castle, but a very important young man. King Robert's acknowledged bastard son and spitting image, Edric Storm. Yet Edric Storm was three inches taller and broader in the chest and shoulders. He was his father's son in that, nor did he ever miss a morning's work with sword and shield. Those old enough to have known Robert and Renly as children said that the bastard boy had more of their look than Stannis had ever shared. The coal black hair, the deep blue eyes, the mouth, the jaw, the cheekbones. Only his ears reminding you that his mother had been a Florent. Edric is perceived as a very powerful political tool with King Robert dead. Not only does his strong Baratheon looks and personality remind people of the dead king in his youth, but he also serves to prove Stannis' case that Cersei's children are not Robert's. There's proof of his sword at Storm's End. Robert's bastard, the one he fathered on my wedding night, in the very bed they made up for me and my bride. Delano was a Florent, and a maiden when he took her, so Robert acknowledged the babe. Edric Storm, they call him. He is said to be the very image of my brother. If men were to see him, then look again at Joffrey and Tommen, they could not help but wonder, I would think. In addition, he could also be married to anyone who wants to raise a banner against the holder of the Iron Throne, pushing his claim as Robert's most true-born son. There may be a match in the future for Shireen and Edric to wed to join the competing Baratheon claims. Shireen and Edric seem to have a blossoming friendship, and Edric is furious that he has to leave Dragonstone without saying goodbye to the princess. Or, to more paranoid minds, Edric would eventually be killed by Stannis to secure his claim, which would make sense, he had just proved himself a kinslayer with Renly Baratheon's assassination. Even after the Shadow Baby ended Renly's life, and Stannis acquired much of his brother's former bannermen, Sir Courtney Penrose and the garrison of Storm's End refused to yield the castle to Stannis. 
and the main reason was the concern over what would happen to Edric Storm. Remain as before, said Stannis. I will pardon you for your treason, as I have pardoned these lords you see behind me. The men of your garrison will be freed under my service or return unmolested to their homes. You may keep your weapons and as much property as a man can carry. I will require your horses and pack animals, however. And what of Edric Storm? My brother's bastard must be surrendered to me. Then my answer is still no, my lord. Lord Florin even tries to convince Sir Courtney that no harm will come to Edric since the boy is his nephew. Meanwhile, Renly Baratheon's corpse was being buried or smuggled away by Loras Tyrell. When Courtney will not yield and Stannis runs out of patience, Melisandre takes over and sends her second shadow baby, Renly's former bannerman, reason that if Sir Courtney dies, his second-in-command, Elwood Meadows, would instantly surrender the, rather than live in a siege and risk his holdings. It is from Tyrion's POV that we learn how Courtney died. A bitter laugh echoed off the shuttered windows. I trust you like one of my own blood, in truth. Now tell me how Courtney Penrose died. It is said he threw himself from a tower. The fact that Courtney Penrose, who had the previous day challenged Stannis to single combat, and dared him to take Storm's End or be named a coward, unexpectedly threw himself from the tower, is a little more than suspicious. A suicide after daring a king to single combat? The garrison must have suspected foul play, and they may have even seen the Shadow Baby at work. Elwood Meadows surrendered immediately and gave over the castle. Stannis, though, did not disband the garrison or punish them as traitors. True to his word to the now very dead Sir Courtney, Elwood has reconfirmed his second-in-command and Seneschal of Storm's End. We can assume the rest of the garrison receives similar rewards. Stannis has had very bad luck with troops and lords he took from his dead brother despite their constant and loud assurances that they never liked Renly anyway. And Stannis is totes the one true king. During the attack on King's Landing and Blackwater Bay, Stannis seemed sure to take the city in his throne until something unbelievable happened. Renly Baratheon arrived at the head of the Tyrell and Lannister armies. Seeing their dead king alive in his signature green armor and charging his enemies, many of Renly's bannermen and troops followed suit and began attacking Stannis' troops. Captain Corain had told him of the end of Stannis' hopes on the night the river burned. The Lannisters had taken him from the flank, and his fickle bannermen had abandoned him by the hundreds in the hour of his greatest need. King Ringley's shade was seen as well, the captain said, slaying right and left as he led the Lion Lord's van. It said his green armor took a ghostly glow from the wildfire, and his antlers ran with golden flames. Bronn tells Tyrion what happened in less colorful language. Is it true Stannis was put to rout by Renly's ghost? Bronn smiled thinly. From the winch towers, all we saw was banners in the mud and men throwing down their spears to run. There's hundreds in pot shops and brothels who tell you how they saw Lord Renly kill this one or that. Most of Stannis' hosts had been Renly's to start, and they went right back over at the sight of him in that shiny green armor. We learn later that this ruse was suggested by Littlefinger, and that Garland Tyrell wore Renly's armor to confuse and sway some of Renly's former troops to fight with them. And it worked to perfection. Stannis was routed and left King's Landing in total defeat losing most of his army, navy, and supporters at the bottom of Blackwater Bay. What this does for our author is establish in our minds as readers that men Stannis won in his previous dual assassinations are more than willing to turn on him if they are motivated by their previous loyalty. Renly's ghost won't be showing up again, but the other Baratheon the garrison showed intense loyalty to is still alive and well, Edric Storm. After Lord Meadows handed over Edric, Davos grew increasingly paranoid about the fate of Edric. Knowing the truth of Melisandre's power and his realization that she was lobbying Stannis to sacrifice the boy for greater favor from Red Relu, Davos steeled to act. Melisandre's mouth made a hard red line, and small men curse what they cannot understand. I am a small man, Davos admitted, so tell me why you need this boy Edric Storm to wake your great stone dragon, my lady. He was determined to say the boy's name as often as he could. Only death can pay for life, my lord. A great gift requires a great sacrifice. In response, Davos hired his pal Salador Sand to murder the Red Priestess and also smuggle Edric far from Stannis' reach. The assassination failed, but the smuggler pulled a fast one and succeeded, sending King Robert's son 
all the way from Dragonstone to Lys in Essos, according to the A Dance with Dragons appendix guarded by five of Stannis' former men. He went to one knee before Edric's storm. I must leave you now, he said. There's a boat waiting to row you out to a galley. Then it's off across the sea. You are Robert's son, so I know you'll be brave, no matter what happens. I will, only... The boy hesitated. Think of it as a great adventure, my lord. Davos tried to sound hale and cheerful. It's the start of your life's great adventure. May the warrior defend you. And may the father judge you justly, Lord Davos. The boy went with his cousin Sir Andrew out the postern gate. Sending Edric far away in secret was a masterstroke by Davos, saving the boy's life and using it to make a point about the value of one boy's life against a kingdom to Stannis. Although in the winds of winter, it seems that Davos may have unintentionally saved one child's life from the flames and put another in Edric's place. Anyway, while Edric is out of the reach of Stannis, he is not out of the reach of the Golden Company, Varys, and Illyrio Mopatis, who have businesses and contacts all throughout the Valyrian Daughters. Varys himself is from Lys, before his unfortunate run-in with that sorcerer, and the spy master of the Golden Company, Lysono Mar, is also from Lys. Two Lyseni spy masters to almost certainly have eyes and little birds in their home cities could probably find a Westerosi noble teen in hiding, especially one as unsubtle as Edric Storm. Varys in particular has a habit of finding long-lost Westerosi nobles in Essos and turning them to his purpose. Some would say that's his entire thing. Using Edric as a secondary version of Young Griff seems like the exact kind of thing you would do. Also, important to remember that it was Salador San who sent Edric to Lys out of loyalty and friendship to Davos. By Dance with Dragons, though, that loyalty has waned from the pirate lord over promises of payment from Stannis that have never arrived. If Salador is unhappy by lack of payment, then his organization probably will be too. Maybe the location of a Baratheon prince in Lys would heal that financial hole for San himself or the crew of the Mad Prendos that transported Edric, a situation that Varys could exploit. You can see the reasoning of why they would want to acquire him. It's very possible that upon seeing Edric storm, after being left behind by Stannis and the memory of Renly and Courtney still swirling in their minds, that there could be a quick mutiny and Sir Gilbert Faring finding himself also flying out of a window inexplicably. The gates open to Edric as he comes home to claim his father's ancestral seat and abandon Storm for Baratheon. Maybe even a royal decree from Aegon VI to legitimize Edric, much like Stannis offered for Jon Snow and promises of rewards beyond what Stannis ever gave them if the garrison hands over the castle to their new lord. It would be like a return of Renly's ghost on the Blackwater and Edric shows up to claim his father's house. And once again, men loyal to his brothers turn on Stannis for even a shadow of the two Baratheons. George could be drafting this exact scenario for the Winds of Winter in his most recent book, Fire and Blood, with the tale of the return of Prince Viserys Targaryen. At the outset of the Dance of the Dragons, the enormous Targaryen civil war that started in 129 AC, the two sons of Queen Rhaenyra and Daemon Targaryen were to be sent away for their safety for Pentos to be fostered. Prince Aegon and Viserys stole away across the narrow sea on board the cog Gay Abandon when they were attacked by the navy of the Kingdom of the Three Daughters. Prince Aegon managed to escape on his dragon, but Viserys was not so lucky. The escort sent to protect the cog were sunk or taken, the Gay Abandon captured. The tale reached Dragonstone only when Prince Aegon arrived desperately clinging to the neck of his dragon, Stormcloud. The boy was white with terror, Mushroom tells us, shaking like a leaf and stinking of piss. Only nine, he had never flown before, and would never fly again, for Stormcloud had been terribly wounded as he fled the gay abandon, arriving with the stubs of countless arrows embedded in his belly and a scorpion bolt through his neck. He died within the hour, hissing as the hot blood gushed black and smoking from his wounds. Aegon's younger brother, Prince Viserys, had no way of escaping the cog. A clever boy, he hid his dragon's eggs and changed into ragged, salt-stained clothing, pretending to be no more than a common ship's boy. But one of the real ship's boys betrayed him and he was made a captive. It was a Tairashi captain who first realized whom they had, Munkin writes. But the admiral of the fleet, Sharako Lohar of Lys, soon relieved him of his prize. Where was Prince Viserys taken, you ask? That missing prince also ended up in the city of Lys. 
Much like Edric, young Viserys spent years abroad in lists in secret. No one in Westeros even knew he was alive. His own brother assumed he had died, and Aegon the Dragon's Bane blamed himself for abandoning his younger brother. After the war was over, and Aegon found himself King of the Seven Kingdoms, his long-lost brother was suddenly found by the Lyseni, and remarkably, the prince was for sale. Viserys was well treated during his captivity. Though forbidden to leave the grounds of Bomberos Mance, he had his own suite of rooms, shared meals with the magister and his family, had tutors to instruct him in languages, literature, mathematics, history, and music, even had a master at arms to teach him swordsmanship, at which art he soon excelled. It is widely believed, though never proved, that Bamboro's intent was to wait out the Dance of the Dragons and either ransom Prince Viserys back to his mother, should Rhaenyra emerge triumphant, or sell his head to his uncle, should Aegon II prove the victor. Alan Valari on the Oaken Fist drove the worst deal ever to secure Viserys' return, giving up giant promises, including a hundred thousand gold dragons, lordships, and notably the promise that Viserys' marriage to Lara Rogar would not be dissolved ever. His identity in captivity made him a perfect target for the enterprising magister Lysandro Roger, who married Viserys to his daughter. That situation may be direct foreshadowing for what to expect when Edric Storm also makes his return from Lys. A prince lost in Essos, powerless and at the mercy of his guardians. His very generous Lyseni guardians that would never part with their favorite guest, Edric. Well, unless a certain extremely wealthy Pentashi merchant and a spider meet their substantial price. What's a stack of gold, a few lordships, maybe even a marriage pact against the Stormlands and a successful invasion of Westeros? Edric would also probably be pretty loyal to his new buddy Aegon forever if the would-be king gives him the birthright castle and name of his father. We have to look no farther than Jon Snow to see exactly how much it would mean to a bastard in the society to be recognized as trueborn. Aegon could give Edric no greater gifts. It would be an absolutely perfect way for the would-be conqueror Young Griffin and his sponsors to secure the Stormlands by seeding Edric in Storm's End. It solves the very real problem of, after the Golden Company seizes the Stormlands, who do they install to rule it? Edric is already a charismatic and beloved figure in the Stormlands. Men are willing to die and face traitors' deaths for his well-being when they defended him from Stannis. Oh, and John Connington has grayscale. If Edric dons the antlered helm of the Baratheons, and maybe takes Warhammer looking like his father were born, that is a popular image that the Stormlanders could rally around. Another Aegon landing in Westeros with another Baratheon at his side conquering the Seven Kingdoms. Edric playing the role of Oris Baratheon come again. Robert's ghost, Renly's ghost, Oris' ghost, and most importantly for John Connington, a brilliant way to secure Storm's End and perhaps the army of the Stormlands for his king in one fell swoop. Through Edric's storm, the blood of Durin God's grief, the Storm Kings at last return to their endless battle against the vengeful gods of Shipbreaker Bay. Theirs is the Fury.